Hello, everyone. My name is George Valdez. If you don't know, I'm the host here, and I'm also the head of marketing here at Monograph. Um, next up on the section wall stage, we have Shefali Sungvi and Alex Muller. Shefali and Alex are from Datner Architects. In this next session, we'll be learning about how Datner's internal sustainable practice group has been increasing their research and development in recent years to push the envelope on sustainability and gather usable metrics to measure the efficacy of their sustainability efforts. Shefali and Alex, welcome to the Section Cut Wall Stage. Thanks a lot, George. Great to have you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So today we're going to be discussing how Datner Architects Internal Sustainable, Sustainable Practice Group, also known as SPG, has been increasing our research and development in recent years. This research has led to white papers and primers on changing codes, new technologies, and the latest sustainable building materials, among other topics. We'll also talk a bit about how Dachner Architects shares this information internally and how we use this research to make informed decisions. My name is Alex Muller, and I'm an associate in Dachner's housing studio. I also co-chair the Dachner Sustainable Practice Group, or SPG. I have experience coordinating the design and construction of complex buildings, ranging from government facilities, cultural structures, multifamily housing, and adaptive reuse projects. This experience informs my advocacy for sustainable architecture. We are in a climate emergency, and I believe that designing sustainably is not only an architect's responsibility, it's also an opportunity to create a better city. Thanks, Alex. Uh, my name is Shafali Sangvi. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. I'm a senior associate in Datner's housing studio, and my interest in architecture really relates to affordable housing. And I've believed from the very beginning, ever since I got into architecture, that you really can't talk about affordable housing without talking about sustainability. And furthermore, once I came to Datner, I realized that you really couldn't talk about the work that we do here uh, without talking about sustainability. And it truly is an integral part of the work that we do. And it's sort of our responsibility to make sure that we're keeping this sustainability focus in mind as we continue to um, build out our environment. Thanks, Shafali. So a little bit about Datner Architects. Uh, Datner Architects Foundation, as it says here, is civic architecture. Most of our projects are in New York City, and we design a range of projects, including transit infrastructure, schools, libraries, housing, healthcare facilities, community centers. And one thing that's uh, consistent among this variety of types of projects is that all of them, with all of them, we have the goal of improving the quality of urban life. In terms of sustainability, one of the central things for me uh, that's in the mission statement is we say, as, as written here, we believe each project must belong to its place and time, tread lightly on the environment and inspire its users. So how did SPG come about? Well, it's really grassroots, and it was kickstarted by the firm's commitment to the AIA 2030 challenge, which I'll cover in a little more depth in a minute. Um, colleagues began meeting a few years ago, uh, once, once a month for lunch, and it was fairly informal, but it quickly grew. There are a lot of people who care about the environment and care about sustainability. So it began again with a handful of people, and it now has between 75 and 80 members. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about in the talk today is how reorganizing the group as it grew has increased our impact. So the 2030 challenge from AIA, some of you may be uh, familiar with this, but I'll just quickly go through it. The, the goal here was to have firms publicly commit and track their, publicly commit to reducing energy consumption and the associated carbon emissions by the year 2030. And a critical part of this was not just tracking it, the progress each year and, and with the, the goal of each year reducing those, those emissions, but also sharing this information so that the different firms could see how they're doing compared to other firms. 40% uh, of US energy is consumed by buildings. So architects and designers play a key role in reducing this energy consumption and the associated CO2 emissions. Uh, however, SPG realized that we need to look beyond just EUI and energy consumption. The definition of sustainability has been evolving. 
Uh, as just mentioned, a few years ago, we started this with a focus on AI 2030 and on energy efficiency. This is a critical part of reducing the impact buildings have on the environment. However, it is one of many interrelated parts. To design sustainably, we must understand the dynamic interaction between the built and natural world. Our interventions affect ecological systems. They also have economic and social impacts. To build sustainably, we must realize that all these things are intertwined. Also at Datner, we believe that equity and social justice play a critical role in the resilience and sustainability of our communities. So on the screen are a few Datner projects, including Hallett's 10, Via Verde, and Chestnut Commons. In Hallett's 10, we integrated green roofs and reflected sunlight into the interior court to increase daylight. Via Verde utilized green roofs. Um, Via Verde used, utilized uh, green roofs, natural ventilation, and renewable energy. It has an urban farm and has gardens that cascade down the roof, integrating social space and biodiversity into the building. And Chestnut Commons on the left was one of our first multifamily affordable housing projects that's also Passive House. So Passive House is something that some of you may be familiar with or at least heard of. And it's something that we're doing more and more of at Datner and is more and more becoming kind of a benchmark or a norm. And uh, just a brief overview uh, about what, what this is um, for those who are less familiar with it. It's, comprises a set of design principles used to attain a quantifiable and rigorous level of energy efficiency within a specific quantifiable comfort level. Uh, one way to think of it is you optimize your gains and losses. So the five key principles for Passive House, one is uh, air tightness. The building envelope is extremely airtight and this prevents infiltration of outside air. Uh, it also prevents the loss of conditioned air. The second is continuous insulation. Uh, this is this is key, uh, continuous insulation throughout the entire envelope, um, and that leads actually to the third principle, which is uh, re reducing or eliminating uh, thermal bridges, really. So thermal bridge-free construction. Um, the continuous insulation uh, is only so good if you have thermal bridges. Um, so we need to have both of those sort of together. Uh, the fourth is employing high-performance windows and doors. Uh, solar gain is managed to exploit the sun's energy and for heating purposes in the heating season and to minimize overheating during the cooling season. And you can really only do that if you have high-performing glass and high-performing windows and doors. And the last one is using some form of balanced heat and moisture recovery ventilation. So even though there's air tightness, that by no means means that there's no ventilation. There's ventilation, but the key is that you're controlling that outside air and you're making sure to recover some of the energy uh, when you're doing ventilation. So the reason, one of the things that's, that, that I bring up Passive House now is it's interesting because it used to be something that we at Datner thought we could only really do in market rate multifamily housing. Um, but in the last few years, it started to become the norm for multifamily affordable housing. And the reason that that is so important uh, is it not only means a more comfortable building for inhabitants and everyone who's in the, in the housing, it also means reduced operating costs since it's lower energy, and that means it's a more affordable home. So just as Passive House made us rethink how we define sustainability in the work we do, resiliency is now an important part of sustainability. Superstorm Sandy made all New Yorkers aware of the importance of resiliency. These so-called one in a hundred year events are occurring far more frequently because of the effects of climate change. And for us, I think we need to think as designers and architects how sustainable design can also make projects more resilient. So for instance, the use of renewable energy and microgrids can create energy independence and therefore make projects more resilient. Or the importance of natural infrastructure on things like stormwater management, or how higher performing buildings can help residents survive periods without power. As part of this idea that we needed to broaden our definition of sustainability, in 2018, we realized that we had to rethink how SVG was organized. And what we decided to do was create six subcommittees. And the reason for this is it will allow the members of SVG to research things that they felt most passionately about, but also as important, 
it allowed people to research these things in more depth, do a d- deeper dive uh, into these topics. Um, so the six subcommittees that make up SPG are the Energy Subcommittee, which keeps Datner up to date on energy code and legislation, and also tracks our energy usage and efficiency. So there does the reporting for the 2030 challenge, among many other things. SPG Renewables, which investigates renewable energy and building technology and how we can integrate this into our projects. SPG Indoor Health, which focuses on the impact the built environment has on the end user health. SPG Materials, which investigates new and alternative construction materials used in superstructure and cladding. Site Ecology, which highlights the best practices to mitigate the impact that construction can have on ecosystems. And the Urban Infrastructure Subcommittee, which expands our database on infrastructure and also transit-related design. We had assumed that there'd be some overlap with these subcommittees, particularly between energy and renewables, indoor health and materials, and site ecology and urban infrastructure, as you can see on this slide. Indeed, these groups are now periodically meeting jointly to collaborate. However, we're also discovering that there's an overlap that was less predictable. And some examples of this are how site ecology influences environmental quality and human health, or how green roofs can mitigate the effects of urban heat island and therefore reduce energy consumption, or the importance of material HPDs as buildings become airtight in order to reduce energy consumption, or how the future of renewable energy infrastructure has to tie into electric vehicles. And finally, the impact of fossil fuel reliance not just on energy and renewables, but also on indoor health and materials since there's so many petroleum-based products. And so now it's like, what do we do with this, right? What do we do with this information? We have so much of it, and how do we most effectively share that knowledge both internally and externally? So we have these monthly meetings where we meet as a group. It's really graduated from that, you know, few people in a conference room talking about sustainability that Alex laid out earlier in the presentation. And basically we start off the meeting with about 15 to 20 minutes of um, open discussion on a topic that really is, uh, that uh, one of our members feels very passionate about. Um, And then we have an agenda driven meeting where we talk about recent articles and podcasts recaps of events, um, staff outside of Datner may have attended, committee updates, updates from uh, professional organizations such as AA COAT and political action. <clears throat> we also use Microsoft Teams to encourage conversation and sharing of ideas and uh, both the wiki function within Teams and Microsoft OneNote to have this informal repository of ideas where people can just sort of like freely share their information um, in a central place in an informal way without worrying about how it's formatted or who's reading it. It's just this sharing of information. And then we take that and we formalize that information through a various series of um, ways. So this image on the right that we have here is an example of a SharePoint post that the Renewable Subcommittee did on photovoltaics. And essentially, it's just this way for us to share this information about what are some of the design considerations that you should keep in mind if you're thinking about incorporating PV into your project, um, and what are some of the common PV installations in New York City. We also share information through green salons, which is really just sort of our fancy term for lunch and learns that have a sustainability bent to it. And so we either invite outside presenters to come in, for example, if uh, someone from Bright Power came in um, and did a recap of changes to New York City and state energy conservation code, and we had, or internal presenters. So for this image on the right, we have from a comm check um, green salon that we did, where where someone from our uh, someone from our office talked about how we demonstrate compliance with energy conservation code. <clears throat> so, for a big part of what we do is this data gathering, and it started with this AIA 2030 commitment, right? Like that's how all of this started. And, but we've really expanded the reach of this form to indicate other areas of interest for our different subcommittees, such as, do you have green roofs? If you do, what kind and what's the square footage? Do you use bird-friendly glass? Do you track embodied carbon? 
And what this allows us to do is it helps us identify projects that we can highlight in subsequent share, SharePoint posts or um, green salons. And it gives us an opportunity to have these data ready, uh, this data set ready for marketing that we can share to continue to elevate our firm's profile in sustainability. <clears throat> So I know I mentioned political action as one of the um, agenda items in our monthly meetings. And I just want to say that like recently it feels like political action, uh, action can really be fraught with a lot of emotion. And I don't know about you guys, but here at Datner, we're really fortunate that our leadership generally agrees with the things that we feel strongly about, but that may not be true for you. So we just wanted to show this um, info graphic that uh, some people from our office put together last year where we had a mayoral election in New York City, <clears throat> and it's sort of this very easy to understand primer that talks about each candidate's position on the six um, areas of interest that are in important to our office that really just aligns with what our subcommittees are. And it gave us an opportunity to just say, like, without judgment, here is information that you should be aware of if you vote, if you, if you can vote in the city election. Because the reality is that we as architects play a big role in the future of the built environment, and we need to be aware of that role and therefore be very cognizant and intentional um, of our choices. So we talk of, you know, we talked about knowledge sharing and the SharePoint posts, and basically it gives each of our subcommittees an opportunity to have these sort of like intermediate check-ins of how is that research going? Can we share that? with um, the office and is there a way for us to have like intermediate check-in so that it doesn't seem like we're spending all this time to get all this research together um, and, and creating this sort of un unnecessary timeline to it. So basically um, we have the six subcommittees as Alex laid out. So SPG Energy, their primary focus is obviously compliance with AIA 2030, but also is undertaking the study where we're looking at actual EUI as reported to the city versus predicted EUI. So we can actually see if our projects are performing as well as we hope they would when they, we were designing them. SPG Renewables is working on a series of white papers that talk about different renewable technology and um, battery storage. So I had mentioned earlier that um, the, I had those images from the PV white paper that they did. Um, Indoor Health is working with materials on a sustainable outline spec, which I will talk about in a minute. But it's also one of the things that we're working on is creating an executive summary of all the different sustainability standards out there so that people can sort of come to one place and say, okay, my client is interested in X and here are the different standards that I can see if they'd be interested in um, going for, or also I can just be aware of those standards to be able to intellectually respond to my client's concerns and my client's priorities. Um, SPG Materials, in addition to the outline spec, also is doing a deeper dive into research such as heavy timber and hemp. Cytecology is working on a series of case studies so that we can look to other projects and see what was successful um, and, and learn from that, right? Because the reality is that we're all always learning from one another and we only benefit if we share that knowledge with one another. And then SPG in, uh, Urban Infrastructure is working on this atlas that really is trying to take all of this transit and infrastructure related data and put it together in one concise place. So, you know, we, we have this screenshot of, of the different SharePoint posts that we've done. And you can see on the column, uh, the column on the right that there's views, it might be a little blurry on your screen, but I wanted to, we wanted to share this information to show that some of these definitely get better engagement than others but at least we're sharing this information so that if someone comes to us, we can say, hey, did you check out this post? This might answer your question. And if it doesn't, why don't you reach out to whoever the author is? Because these authors now become internal um, experts for that particular topic, and they can get a better handle of what the questions are for the, to uh, for the topics that they've done research on. <clears throat> Basically, all of this research and data gathering and knowledge sharing is, is a cyclical process, right? Research influences our projects, which then inform future research. And this idea of like lessons learned, we have this opportunity to constantly be learning from one another and being able to optimize the performance of our projects. 
and it really gives us an opportunity to avoid recreating the wheel, right? The last thing we want is project teams working in silos and not sharing information with one another so that we can create more effective and efficient projects. So these, this slide here is the, um, a screenshot from our Passive House CA group, which was created to allow us to learn from one another about what are some of the things that happen in construction that we may not pick up in design. You know, in design, it's really easy to borrow details from one project and an, and an, or others, but we all know that when you go into construction, a lot of things can go wrong. And so to have this sort of this wiki with all of this information in it gives us the opportunity to be like, okay, this was a problem in this project, so I'm going to try to get ahead of it on my project that I'm working on now, two years later, and it gives us an opportunity to like have this information when the client or the GC is like, why are we doing this upgrade, right? And basically what it's allowed our firm to do is continue to build affordable, good affordable passive house projects because we have this arsenal of facts, such and including things like ROI to convince clients <clears throat> and contractors. So, those were some of the short-term or more ongoing initiatives. So some examples of some of the longer-term initiatives that we're doing is, uh, or we have done rather, in 2019, which is the image on the left, we did create this primer on the Climate Mobilization Act, which was a series of local laws that New York City had passed <clears throat> and changes to the New York State and Energy Convers Conservation Code. We had intended for this document to be an internal document, right? It was just like every, you know, a bunch of people came together and created executive summaries for each of these laws and said, here are some of the things that you should pay attention to based on the type of work that we do in our office. So, but we found out that a lot of project teams were just taking this pamphlet and sharing it with clients because it was such a concise way to say like, these are the changes that are coming down the pipeline these are the things that you should be aware of. And this is why this building might be a little different from the building that you create, you know, that you designed or built a couple of years ago. <clears throat> the image on the right is an image of our sustainable spec alternative. So essentially the indoor material, uh, sorry, indoor health and materials subcommittee got together and split up the spec based on CSI sections and really just did a deeper dive and try to quickly highlight what is it in the product that you're using right now? Why is it a problem? What is a red list? And why is it important to know if materials in your product are um, on the red list? And what are some of the alternatives, if there are any at all, that you could use? And what are the impacts of making that switch to your design or other parts of your building? And so, you know, this image here, it's really dry, but the reality is that sometimes that's how the information is shared. Not everything, I know as architects, and designers are really compelled to make sure that we have these great images and you know how is this information shared but sometimes it's just information and we also in both the primer and the spec linked a lot of things because you know the other unfortunate reality is that we're not scientists we're not policy makers we can only read these things and help distill that information for you but you should continue to research on your own to make sure that you have a better understanding of what the situation is. The thing that we're working on now is the development of a primer on building electrification. New York City recently passed a law effectively banning natural gas hookups in new construction, and there's a law being debated at the state level. So since we know this is happening, this gives us an opportunity to sort of get ahead of these changes and start letting project teams and essentially our clients and contractors know that this is coming. And this is why we can't have a gas fired boiler, for example. <clears throat> we also work really closely with our office's marketing team. Uh, we share our work on Datner social media to increase our firm's profile as a leader in sustainability. And we've heard anecdotally from <clears throat> leadership in our firm that do actual interviews, that interviewees often mention our commitment to sustainability as one of the reasons they want to come work for Datner. And selfishly for Alex and I, it really makes what we're doing worth it, right? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of people. And yes, it's a lot of overhead, but this is why we're doing this, right? We want to make sure people are aware of these things. And we want to make sure that people are aware that our firm takes this commitment seriously. Um, 
and also it gives us new members, right? We people we hear it from um, from people that uh, during their interview the SPG group was mentioned. We're able to sort of say, hey, we heard about this. You should join our group. We'd love to have you. And for all new hires, we do send welcome emails during their first week of work, where we highlight who you know who they could reach out to if they're interested in joining SPG and who the subcommittee chairs are and what each subcommittee is working on. This image here is an example of our 2021 end of year wrap up post where we highlighted some of the work we did, as well as some pretty impressive stats, right? We have 193 pounds of personal composting. We completed our first passive house project, which is the image on the left. We have three in construction, two in design. The three that are in construction should come online this spring. So I'm really excited to see uh, what our 2022 wrap up post looks like. We did seven green salons and did 33 SharePoint posts, which I think for a, a year of true COVID fatigue, when we were all working from home and getting really sick of just staring at our apartments, I think that's, that's really impressive. So <laughs> what is New York City doing, right? And, and you know, this, the slide shows that New York City is doing a lot. And we found that SPG really needed to be at the forefront of these changing codes and requirements to be able to disseminate this information to project teams and address concerns that may come up based on typologies. It also gives us this unique opportunity to see where there's potential contradictions between code or, be, you know, within the code or between code and zoning and work with peer firms to try to figure out a way to tackle these discrepancies or contradictions. And really, because we've spent so much time over the years setting up this framework for SPG, we are able to pretty seamlessly get ahead of these laws and share information and, and make sure that our staff can talk about these changes to projects that are coming online. <clears throat> so looking ahead, right? I think ultimately I feel SPG needs to be aware of all the standards and industry trends as it relates to what because it relates directly to what we should focus on. Personally, I feel that pendulum is shifting towards indoor health. And in addition to operational carbon, which all will always be a concern of sustainable groups, um, we should, we're also starting to look at embodied carbon, right? So the image on the left is um, just a highlight of well building standards. We're hearing more clients ask about well and fit well, both of whom really look into occupant health and comfort. And then, you know, in addition, so the image on the right with the net carbon, net zero carbon buildings, I think, you know, how is that defined? How can we reasonably achieve that? And are we also looking at embodied carbon? And we look at that internally by the use of Tally and EC3, which are free or soon to be free plugins for Revit, so that it's part of our workflow. We are not trying to um, add in this extra layer of sustainability, but it's just like, okay, at this point, you can go ahead and run this analysis to do things like embodied carbon. So now what, right? How do we continue to push this envelope? And I think the reality is that we don't necessarily have to defend our purpose, but we always have to be aware of our relevancy. And the question that we continually, continuously need to ask ourselves is how do we stay at the forefront and continue to push the envelope in both our practice and our designs? This is, you know, what, what's the responsibility of an architect? And I think part of the responsibility is understanding that these definitions are changing and that we are all adapting. I think the last two years have shown us anything. It's that we have to maintain this flexibility. We have to continue to be able to adapt because otherwise we're just going to phase out, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. And I think it's important to understand that as architects and designers, we have the opportunity to make these changes. And if we can gather these data points or point to the research we've done internally or with our projects, it really helps bolster our points and further that collective goal. And if we can bring more evidence to the table to address client and GC concerns and to indicate that our work has a tangible impact and that there's an actual value in doing this work and, um, implementing this work uh, and being more sustainable while always remembering that there's this broader definition um, at play. And that 
basically takes us to the end, right? I always enjoy ending our presentations with this cartoon. It's an old cartoon. I'm sure some of you, many of you have already seen this before, but I think it's a great cartoon because I think the reality is no matter your position, ultimately the worst thing that happens is that we're just creating a better world <laughs> for the people that come that are coming in after us. Um, so before we completely go to Q&A, I can already see some things that are coming in. I just wanted to take a second to go over some of our poll question responses. Um, I don't know who's who can help us out with that. I think you're muted, George. Hey, yes. that's me. <laughs> I'm here to help. Um, okay, so we had two, two different uh, poll questions, and I'll try to see if I can put them up here. So one was, um, the question was, do you, you know, to the audience, do you have a dedicated group or person who focuses on sustainability in your organization? And about, uh, oh, but surprisingly, I mean, 66% said yes, they had somebody in the organization that is focused on sustainability, which is really, really great. Um, and then the other uh, question here was, um, let's see if there's another one. I think there was another one. Oh, yeah. Do you have a, do, 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 have you found that your, def this was a very fascinating one. Do you find that your definition of sustainability has changed in recent years? Um, and also a very large number of people, about 81% said yes, that, that that's been a kind of a shifting target. And I think your research also, I mean, the way that the sustainability practice group is set up underscores a little bit, right? It's it's not like one, it's like continuously evolving as we learn more about what's working and what's not working, right? Um, yeah, sorry, I just got distra <laughs> distracted by the chat that came in after. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, so something that I struggle with, and this, this may not directly answer what you said, but something that I struggle with is that I often come across people in, you know, whether it's uh, colleagues or uh, from peer firms or from the ownership side or from the contractor side that are like, but this is the way I've been always been doing it. And this was okay five years ago. And this was okay 10 years ago. And it, and it's sort of, you know, it's like, I understand their frustration and you can definitely hear it in their tone when they try to have that conversation with you. But the reality is that the world is changing. Right. And, and as a result, so is all of this. And we can't say we can't stay static. We can't stay stagnant. And that's always for me in, in many ways, that's always the most fun conversation to have, especially with like a subcontractor on site where they're like, well, I did it this way, like three years ago. Why do I have to change now? And then drawing these diagrams and like talking to them about it. And more often than not, I know they're just humoring me and that they're either going to do what they want to do or someone's going to tell them that they have to listen to me. But it is nice to be able to have that dialogue um, and to be able to say that, like, this is why this is important. I don't want you to just listen to me. I want you to understand why this is important to me in the hopes that this is also this also becomes important to you. I thought it was really fascinating how to hear a lot about how um, you know, it's a very local firm, right? So I think for those audience, for the audience, maybe one takeaway about, for, for at least that could be maybe applied to different geographies or different places in the U.S. or the world is just like your op, the firm seems to be operating from a place where it really deeply knows the needs of its and the challenges of its uh, target, let's say, client, right, um, within civic uh, typologies, and is really basically kind of like the conduit between policy changes that are happening in New, in New York, right, locally, and digesting that, filtering that on one, like, you know, in one spectrum, doing that as a service to clients, right, to basically improve the service um, that the company's providing, positioning itself as an expert because it's done the work of digesting this information and letting people know, like the client base know, hey, this is what's up, what's uh, changing, right? And that is a trigger potentially for, more engagement, new projects, or like being able to provide expertise as a service, right? And I think that's a really kind of fascinating way that that has come about. And it almost even more fascinating is uh, how some of that seems to have come out also organically from the group, right? Like the, it, it's it's an interesting, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it looks like it's a really fascinating case study of like how a, a firm trusts its, its employees to kind of say, hey, this is like, not just from a personal interest only, but it maps over to 
a strategy in a very clean way. Um, I don't know. That's kind of like an impression that I had from it. I, yeah, I think it's 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 interesting because one thing that you sort of touched on was had to do with with clients, and we have a lot of um, like-minded clients who come to the table who care about this stuff too, right? And I think a lot of people have that. But I was at a, another conference recently on on resiliency, and someone brought up a, a good point, which is you know clients have a range of experience with with building. Some will have done this a lot, some won't. But this person brought up that sometimes clients are very interested in doing this, but they won't necessarily know what questions to ask, right? And if it's this, if the whole point is adaptability and unpredictable, you know, not being able to predict the future, that's fine. But but what questions do we need to be asking for a project early, early on in the project that affect the whole project? And part of the goal of SPG is so that everyone in the firm is at least aware of these issues. So that if there's a discussion happening, and they're aware that something might relate to this, they could bring it up and it, it could be discussed early on. I, I'm curious about, and I know this might be out, outside of your scope, but the, you know, a lot of this information, uh, we're wearing my marketing hat on, right? I really thought it was fascinating how some of this kind of like goes into marketing. And I, you know, I think fundamentally, we have yet to really see the power of unleashing content from architecture into the streams in which people are really consuming. Like, it was very interesting how you brought up the, um, you know, this um, social media, right? And how helpful it's been for re uh, recruitment. Because like today, it's likely that anybody that's doing homework on a new firm is likely going on their Instagram account to quickly see, it's like the new portfolio, right? And it, the benefit there is that you can be uh, more explicit in some sense of what it is you can kind of dive deeper than maybe even a web, website can sometimes. Uh, I'm just I, reflecting on the presentation about how that could be a powerful vehicle to continue to produce, take the content that you're producing internally, currently as SharePoint and just put them out into the world so that more people that are trying to find these topics that could be potential clients of yours find you. Uh, I'm just curious around thoughts around that because it seems like there's a, a pipeline of how this content comes out, but I'm curious, like, where, how else could it come out in what other mediums? Yeah, I mean, I will say that this is, this really ultimately is a group effort, right? And not only a group effort within SBG, but uh, we couldn't do it if our firm didn't support us, as you said earlier, in, in our efforts and really encourage this research. Um, and we couldn't do it if marketing did not ag also agree that talking about our sustainability efforts was a big part of what we wanted to be known for. Um, so I think, you know, we're still working through some of that. And uh, because it's so grassroots, it's like one of us is like, hey, why don't we do this? Does this work? Can we, who do we talk to to see if this is a way to do it? And it is something that we've really um, talked about. For example, in 2018, we did a zero waste challenge over the summer. And part of that was creating this whole like, you know, doing a lot of research into how trash was managed in New York City and where does our trash go and where is it really going once once you, you know, throw it in that garbage bag. And we did a lot of work and it was like, oh, this could be a really interesting study that we could, you know, produce and share externally as, as part of Danner's commitment to, to waste and sustainability in general. And it's just a matter of time, ultimately, right? I think that when the will is there, that's a big part of it, but we also need to follow up um, follow up with being able to have time to, be, to do these things, be, both between us and marketing. Because as Alex said, it is a grassroots organization, right? A lot of our staff is doing this work on their own time or outside of billable work. So hopefully we get to a point where we can have an allocated amount of time to do this research. I know we're almost done, but I wanted to answer Elaine's question. Can I? Yes. Just do that quickly. Absolutely. So she she asked, do you have any stats or case studies that present? Oh, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, that this is part of a larger effort. We rely on people who do this for a living to help answer some of these questions. So, you know, for, for us, we work in the, our housing studio, especially we work with a bright power or Stephen Winter, and we help them. We work with them to help answer these questions. It's much easier to talk about how. Uh, the changes we're advocating for impact maintenance. It's a little more difficult to talk about increased property value, especially in the realm of affordable housing, where there's so many things going against us 
<laughs> unfortunately, with property values. And, and for the market rate projects, usually they have a marketing team on board that really talks about how some of these changes can impact what their rent rolls could be. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely part of the, it's part of the questions that we continue to ask ourselves. I, I can one, just to add one thing to that, uh, that seems relevant to, to what's going on in the world today is one of the arguments that we do make for committing to full building or full building electrification is the price of oil is uncertain. And I think that that's pretty uh, obvious today. And you could argue that electrical prices could go up and down too. But when you start talking about microgrids and uh, even doing um, microgrids that involve community solar, there, there's a future out there and we're not far from it where we can have a lot more energy independence. And I think that the political crisis is highlighting that these days. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank you both for just an amazing presentation that walked us through the entire group, its origins. And I, I think there's so much that I would, I would love to talk more about just like the, the process in some way, because I feel like there's even things about like uh, political advocacy or lobbying as part of what you do in a sense of just like how you can put this information, like what you learn out into the world to change policy in New York, but uh, that's all the time we have. So, uh, but thank you so much for following Alex for joining us today. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for having us. I think um, our contact information is somewhere in this great um, program that you guys have for all of this. So if you have more questions or want to talk about this, please feel free to reach out to it as uh, reach out to us rather, as you can tell, we're very passionate about this and we love talking about this stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.